Hello, and welcome back to the Dumb Bitch Book Club. I'm whispering because I don't want to get demonetized uh, right at the beginning of the video, because that's usually when they do it. Wait, really? They do. Does they, that happen to they, this? Yes. Oh, I didn't have. know that. I know. Really? Just for that? <laughs> just for that. I've seen a lot worse stuff that is monetized. I know. But you know what? We're avoiding that today. I'm Chandler. I'm Hayden. And today we're going to be talking about A Court of Thorns and Roses by uh, Sarah J. S. I'm super excited to talk about this with you because I feel like this has been a really long time coming. Is this a joke that I'm not getting, the Sarah J. S.? She's never had her ass out in public, no, but like, people, people have strong opinions about her books. Okay. okay cool. <laughs> so, That's what I was wondering. Yes. I am excited to talk about this book with you because this is one of the books that I originally had thought about when I was creating like the inception of the Dumb Bitch Book Club. Besides Twilight, I really wanted to read Akatar with you. I'm just thrilled. I'm thrilled to have your input on this book because it's a very divisive book in the book community. Some people hate the shit and then there is an ungodly amount of merch and whatnot around the series. So it's like people love it or they really hate it. See, I'm very interested to see why people hate it so much. I'm not saying that I liked it necessarily, mm -hmm. but like to have such a strong response as, you know, a controversy and or a lot of people that vehemently hate it. I would say, honestly, if you didn't loathe the first book, then you probably are going to be fine with the series as a whole. That being said, I think the second book maybe has a little bit more zest to it and like things that people could dislike, but I personally feel like if you didn't hate this one, you probably won't hate the rest, so. Well, it's like, I have I think I've just read many worse books recently. This is true. So. You did have to read Twilight, which I don't think it's a worse book, but I think this mm. has a more interesting plot. And I also feel like this in comparison to Brayshaw also much better. Yeah. So <laughs> I think like in the writing and in the thematic elements. This is true. So I don't know. I feel like I set you up pretty well for this one. And I think I did a good job with that because upon reread, I still enjoy it just as much as I did the first time. So you I were was... part of the camp that like it. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I... I mean, I should have known you have more than one of the books on your shelf. Over I do. Here, so. And you know what? It's funny too, because you wouldn't think that I'd be the kind of person to like this book. Like I definitely am not a huge fantasy fan and I don't really talk about the series on my channel as a whole. So I feel like a lot of people just assume assume that I'm in the camp of people among my friends, especially too, that like, you know, I, I don't like this series, but I do. I do actually enjoy it. I think it's fun. I think for me, this is such a romance heavy series and there's a lot of ass clap, cheat. What am I trying to say? A lot of cheat clapping. Yeah. That's not really something that's super common in young adult fantasy. So I think that's mm. probably why I enjoyed it Though so I will say she, she really tried to do her best to keep it PG, PG or PG-13. Oh, don't worry, babe. The sequel? Does she use any curse words in it ever? I'm not sure that they talk about his throbbing member. No, not that. I'm just saying they keep saying like, obscene like, gesture. No, like she cursed or yeah, I cursed through an obscene gesture. That's something we can talk about later because I have questions about that too. Okay. I, you know, I don't actually remember if it's, if it's brought up in the other books, but anyway, that's the background kind of got here. But how did you feel overall about this book? Give me like your general thoughts and then we'll just jump right into the content. Mm. And I'll let you know how I felt too. Like I said, I, I've read many worse books recently. So so it wasn't that bad. I just remember I was in the first couple of chapters when you first asked me, how are you enjoying it so far? And this was before I knew that it was controversial. So I was like, fine, like, what do you mean? But given this was mostly first, second chapter sort of stuff. So this was just her like seeing the wolf. And I was like, that was a fine scene. Like, I don't, I don't know what was wrong with that. You know, there was a lot of stuff that got kind of repetitive, I feel. And then the ending was a little strange to me, but overall, not as bad as a lot of the stuff that I've read recently. Would I don't know that I would say that I enjoyed it, enjoyed it enough to want to read the, okay. the rest sequel. of the series like See, on my own. Thing. You know okay. what I mean? That's like fair. that's what I'm judging it on. If you asked me to read it, would I read it? Yes, it wouldn't be as bad as some of the stuff that I've read. But You're not I wouldn't. Compelled yes, exactly. That's fair. That's fair. Kind of. I wouldn't say it surprises me, but I feel like having I know what happens. I still feel like it was enough of a cliffhanger of an ending to where I want to know what's going to happen next. Because I feel like there were a few things that I forgot that happened at the end, and when I reread it, I was like, well, shit. Now I want to know what happens next. Well, I'm gonna have to hear what those are because I didn't really have a whole lot of questions. At the end. That's fair. That's fair. And I think that's kind of the beauty of the series, in my opinion, is that even though I've read it before, and I read it in 2017, which isn't that long ago, I feel like I still have things that I forget that make it an, an enjoyable experience, mm. even though that big cliffhanger, or not big cliffhanger, the big plot twist in the second book that happens is something that I know is going to happen. I still am anticipating it and excited about it. So I'm not going to spoil it for you, obviously, because we might read the second book if people want us to read the second book. So from my perspective, like I was saying, I really enjoy this book. I remember reading this senior year. It's, you know, 
I, I have developed and grown as a person, but not enough to not like this book. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's get into the meat of this book, how we felt, the things that we learned along the way. First things first, I think when I opened up this book and read that beginning scene, that mm. opening scene, I had remembered it. I did know that there was kind of a hunting scene, but I was getting a lot of Katniss from Hunger Games vibes, which I'm realizing is probably a reference that you don't know, mm -mm. which is fine. Not at all. Um, I didn't read the books or see the movies. <laughs> but I will say, it's, I think it's a good setup because it does draw you in and get you curious, especially since I think a lot of young adult books that are centered on like female protagonists don't necessarily have strong openings. Like in the beginning of Twilight, it's not super intriguing, except for like the prologue where you're like, oh, to die, whatever. No, not really. It, it's, it's, not that, it's not that interesting, right? So like, I kind of liked this and I also like that it lets you know that she is not like every other bitch, bitch. you know? Like she's different. She hunts for her yeah, family. Yeah, they definitely she do takes a lot care of that in the beginning. <laughs> they really do. They have to set her up as like different from her sisters. What did you think of the of the beginning? I mean, like I said, when I read the opening, like I thought it was fine. I mean, I didn't think a whole lot of it. Like it was like fantastic or anything. It was solid. I think something that I didn't realize whenever I picked this book up though is how strong the characterization is of the sisters right off the bat. I don't mm -hmm. know if, did you immediately hate them or was that just me? I mean, I didn't <laughs> hate both of them. I mean, I just hated Nesta. Nesta, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Old Nestle. <laughs> Obviously, at the beginning of the book, she goes, she hunts for her family, she brings back a wolf skin and a deer, and that's sort of like the main conflict that comes up later in the book, but she brings these things home and we see the treatment of her by her family is pretty fucked up. Like her dad is, uh, he, he's got an injury, he's disabled, and he is unable to take care of the family and he's not really willing. He has too much pride, I guess, to admit to any shortcomings and just doesn't do anything to really help the family, he tries to kind of ignore the issues at hand. I feel like Elaine, again, is pretty ignorant to everything and she's kind of stupid, so I feel I feel like I was able to ignore her a little bit more. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I didn't really pick up the like stupid vibes. I just picked up young. Cause like, do they say how old she is? Sarah's 19 okay. and the two sisters are older than her. So- Wait, Elaine is older than her too? Yeah. Okay. Interesting that you mentioned that because I always thought that Pharaoh was the oldest um, and taking care of everybody. But I think it's even worse that they have her as the youngest. Mm -hmm. And she's got these 20 year old sisters who like don't do anything around the house. Nesta is just like, I want your fucking money and I want to be rich and I miss being rich. And then Elaine is just kind of dumb. I don't know if she was intentionally characterized that way, but she's supposed to be this like sweet, like flowery, flowery. And since she is older than Farrah, to me, I read that as dumb. <laughs> Had she been younger, I would have maybe seen it as naive and innocent. See, that's why I But didn't... no, I just thought she okay. was kind of stupid. I feel bad for Farrah. Although I do think they kind of laid it on a little bit thick. I don't know. Oh, if 100%. No, that's like one of the, one Critiques of my first notes just says, oh, poor me. Yeah. I feel like they could have done it in a more subtle way and I feel like it almost would have made me sympathize with her more had her situation been a little bit tougher. Not like more difficult to to be in, but more as in like she was conflicted about her family. Oh, well like my sisters don't help out, but they're like really good people or you know, just something. Yeah. But instead we're just like made to hate everybody. I think that I would have just written them off entirely had I not disliked them in the beginning to like them in the end. That's fair. I think- Or at least like them a bit more. And I think for me, that's a kind of recurring theme throughout the book. And I think that's why I connect so much to the series is I feel like the motivations in this book are very human. And I feel like I really understand them. That's so often my critique of books. And I'm not able usually to put it into words. Why I don't like books is because I, I might connect with the character and think they're cool, but I would never personally feel the same way. Mm -hmm. But I really feel like I connected with her. And yeah, sometimes like you are not close with your family and they kind of suck, but you have to kind of do what you have to do yeah. to survive. I, I really connected with her feelings. And I think her motivations and her feelings throughout the story make a lot of sense, you know, even though she does end up going to this place that's a lot better, she's and, still kind of unhappy. And I think that if she had actually liked her family, then they wouldn't have been able to really justify her leaving, you know, yeah. and or like her feelings, uh, her conflicted feelings on wanting to stay and wanting to leave once she got to Prithia. Prithian? Prithian, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. So from there, I think this sort of sets up the conflict of the book, obviously. We've got Farah. she essentially murders a Fairy, which is the wolf that she ends up skinning. She didn't know it was fairy, but she, I think she kind of knew something was up. It was a well, she very, said it. it was a very large wolf. So yeah. she, she skins the wolf. She ends up selling the pelt. But one night around the delicious venison that they're eating <laughs> at dinner, big hulking beast just slams through their door, puts its paws up on their table and starts speaking in English, basically saying, which one of you did it? Which one of you is the murderer? And Farrah has this confrontation with who we eventually find out is Tamlin. She ends up having to go with him to fairy. She can either die 
right now, or she can go to fairy, and she obviously decides to go to fairy. So that's to fairy. The land is like fairy. She ends up going to you know the fae lands. So that's sort of the setup for the the main conflict of the book at the very beginning. So two things off the bat here. One, mm -hmm. I had a very hard time visualizing what Tamlin's beast form looks like. That's fair. I don't know. I'm assuming that there's probably some kind of fan art out there or something like that. Um, since you said that there was a lot of merch surrounding the book. Yes. I don't know that I've actually ever seen a visualization, though. Of oh, that. really? Yeah. Tamlin okay. is not a favorite character. Okay. But still, you know, I would, would, would have just assumed that they would have had some kind of visualization, because I don't really understand what he's supposed to look like. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it matters that much, but I, they said like the wolf, uh, the body of a wolf. I thought it said the body of a bear and then like the head of a wolf with and horns. horns. That's but good what though. kind of horns? Like, like, I'm thinking like ram. Like ram horns or like a narwhal horn or like. I'm thinking like ram. Okay, so that was your first issue. What's your other issue? I fucking hate the name Tamlin. You know, you, you, it's you just, make points. <laughs> it's just so dumb. It's such a, I don't know, I want to say a weak name. Maybe he's a weak- Tamlin. It's even worse than the name Tammy, and I'm not a huge fan of the name Tammy either. He ends up being kind of a weak guy near the end of the book, does he not? Tam. You know, he gets kidnapped by a lady. Not that ladies are any less powerful, but- Is he really weak, though? He's kind of a little bitch. I mean, she also lets herself get captured to try to- save the one that she loves. That's different. Let's stay linear, okay. shall we? But I think that's a fair critique. I don't love the name Tamlin, but it actually doesn't bother me. I kind of like the way it rolls off the tongue, although I don't think it's sexy. Nope, I don't like it at it's all. It's not It's not a bedroom name. It's not Tam. Name I wouldn't want to really call, you know, like, oh, Tam, take me away. Ram me, Tamlin. Hey, that kind of works. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> so she ends up going to the Fade Lands, and she starts to kind of see what her life is going to be like. Are you playing footsies with me? Mm -mm. She ends up going to the spring court and she doesn't know it's the spring court at the time, but it's this big palatial manor. It's beautiful, flowers everywhere, kind of crawling up this place and there's servants and there's a lot of good food. And the two main people that she deals with are Tamlin and Lucian. Lucian is a emissary and they're buddies. She spends a lot of time with Lucian, I would say, near the beginning of the book. And I think he kind of reveals certain things and is sort of a plot device, if you Even will. Even though at the <laughs> beginning of the book, he really, I want to say dislikes her. We find out later that it's not a real dislike, but yeah, he, he really dislikes her for killing his friend. Which is fair. Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny too, because I forgot, honestly, that the wolf was a fairy. Because I feel like after this book, no one ever brings that up again. And near, uh, okay. near the middle of the book. I was going to say, kind of, like, kind of like the whole time they reference to the fact that she's killed a fairy. They like, never let it go. <laughs> but no one really gives a shit after that. After no, but that's what I'm saying. They do. They, they keep bringing it up to her. I don't know. <laughs> They're like, oh, it shouldn't, really should... <laughs> it shouldn't really matter though to you since you've like, you know, killed so many fairies before. You're a fairy killer human. Oh man, you must be so strong since you've killed a fairy. Sometimes I forget things and sometimes <laughs> things just seem less relevant. When there is love to be had, I just, I care less. I also, I don't know if you noticed this, but Lucian actually reveals his name before Tamlin does. No, oh, yeah, 100%. Which I thought was strange. I think he only learns Tamlin's name through Lucian. Like mm -hmm. he hears Lucian say, Tamlin, don't do this. Yeah. Which mm, interesting. And I also started noticing how strange the speech was around the time that she starts hanging out with Lucian. They end up going out on like horses and Lucian says something like, I admire your bull, Sparrow. And I thought that was so interesting because I feel like the speech is definitely a little bit like more highbrow throughout the book. And then you get these weird moments of like mm -hmm. modern like yeah. balls or shit, Farah, I'm not that old. Yeah. <laughs> Just things like that. I I don't know. I mm, Choices were made. I'm not sure that I like those choices. Choices were made. <laughs> also, something that we should probably mention here and that I kept forgetting throughout most of the book is that everyone in Spring Court is stuck in a mask due to a curse. So they all have these masks from a masquerade ball on their face and have had them for... How long did he say it was? It's, it's 49 years. 49 years they've had them on? Yeah. Yeah. One, I just keep forgetting that everyone's wearing a mask and they must look kind of stupid. And then also I'm just imagining having a, a mask on my face for even a whole day and like how, how sweaty that and be? uncomfortable and irritating that would be. Well, I'm kind of picturing it more as something that's like almost enmeshed in the face. Like you probably wouldn't feel it after a while, but I do think it's interesting too because it's almost used <laughs> as a device. I've seen this like a couple of times in people's critiques or reviews of this book mm -hmm. that the mask is like, oh my God, I don't know how hot Tamlin is because he's got this mask on his face, but like I can see his eyes and like, you know, is it really obscuring like his bone structure that much? Like I doubt it. I no, think I mean, know. every time I've seen a depiction of a masquerade ball, I don't really think that it hides anyone's face. I've always wondered what the real purpose of a masquerade ball was 
was because I don't think it really hides your identity. Yeah, anyway, especially if you can like see that. someone's eyes, you can tell who it your is. Your eyes so. and their jaw, jaw and mouth. Joke's on you. We know who's, who you is. We know Unless your Unless their nose is like really messed up or something, then I think you can tell. Or you've got like a like. Phantom of the Opera situation going on. Your face is all like messed up under the mask. Yes. But, but like only under the mask. But we could tell that it was like gilded almost and like it doesn't actually obscure his face. So anyway, yeah, I thought that was kind of stupid. I feel like they do that to kind of further the whole Beauty and the Beast plot line, but I don't think it's necessary. Because this is such a loose Beauty and the Beast retelling. I mean, besides like the mask, I don't know. Yeah, and also the fact that he turns into a beast and a man is... I don't think that the mask really furthers the beast side of like not knowing what he looks like and, and yeah. really having to, you know, not to get too far ahead of ourselves again, but you know, part of the curse, as they mentioned later in the book, is that she has to really see past the mask and like be able to fall in love with like the person behind the mask and like it's so stupid because he's still... Hot. Yeah, that's like the first thing that she says is how hot both of them are. Doesn't she, so... doesn't she like do the deed with him while he's got the mask on? Mm-hmm, yeah. 100%. So, she's, she's still thinking I will point out, I kind of forgot how boring the middle of this book is. I think that's my main complaint. Super boring. It's weird because I don't think you can really condense it because I was thinking of ways in which she could have made the book shorter and made it still as effective, but I don't think we would have gotten as much into Farrah's mind and also known like her attraction to Tamlin over time had we not had this kind of like long, boring, <laughs> meandering plot line. And, in the and, and of the I book. also think that it kind of had to happen because, you know, she spends months there yeah and most of it she's not doing anything she's just and in or uh, otherwise you, she would just be like so i spent months there and that was it yeah <laughs> and that was it like just mentioning it and passing would be super weird so the only thing i feel like she actually does is get herself into trouble which we can talk about now do you want to talk about the surreal a little bit well she hears from lucian that they're well does she hear from lucian or tamlin first I don't think it really surreal. matters. Well, she hears that there's this, like, fairy creature that she can capture, and if she captures it, then it'll tell her anything that she wants. Honestly, it's kind of interesting, because I feel like Tamlin was fairly forthcoming with her, and she didn't even ask him questions. Like, the stuff that she ends up asking the surreal, it's not like she approached Tamlin for a lot of these things, and he was like, fuck mm -hmm. you. I think it's interesting that you would go out of your way to be a stupid bitch and try to capture this thing, but I digress. Then again, she doesn't really know how dangerous it is to capture it, because, you know, Lucian says, I'm not... It technically like tells her exactly how to do it and like gives her the tools to do it but also says don't do it but it seems like kind of a formality just so he won't get in trouble with Tamlin for like telling her how to do it. In that regard I think that she really underestimates how dangerous the situation could be either with just the surreal or with the uh is it the naga or the naga the I naga think, I don't think who knows well uh, eggy naga it ends up being much more dangerous than she anticipates this is true but i do think she sets up traps and stuff beforehand and i think she's she, a huntress she's a huntress and i feel like she knew kind of going in that this is probably not the best idea but also she values her life very little and that's fair she's been through a lot she's been through the ringer and she almost starved to death a few times back home so it's like you know what what is a fairy beast nothing ain't no thing so <laughs> she does almost die during the situation but she ends up getting attacked by creatures that actually were looking for her and the surreal they ended up getting away from a pack of naga basically so there's like four that come but there's a pack that tamlin was hunting he ends up saving her from this situation but she does before that learn some interesting information from the surreal and she also kills two of the naga herself she does so she's a bad bitch to let you know bad bitch no one else no no human could do that but this isn't the bad bitch book club so we need to talk about how she's so how fun. she's kind of a damage. Yeah. Well, we do find um, out though that she she does Tamlin is part of the the high court. Like he is he's on the the spring court prince. Yeah, before <laughs> before she finds this out from the serial, we have no idea. We just think that he's high fae. I think we're supposed to believe. Oh my god, he's so humble and down to earth for not telling her. I don't know if you got that vibe. I didn't really get that vibe. I just like bumped it in with all of the stuff that he's not telling her. Like he hasn't really told her much of anything. He didn't even tell her his own name. So it didn't surprise me that he wasn't like, by the way, I'm basically fucking king of this shit. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair. He, yeah. He's definitely not forthcoming, but I, I never got the vibe that he didn't want to tell her things. Well, I mean, we find out a little later that he doesn't really like that he's he's the, yeah the, the high lord yeah so uh, i can understand why he isn't very forthcoming with his titles seeing as he doesn't necessarily want to embrace it himself but yeah we find out that there's a lot of trouble going on all around prithian not just in the spring court but that all of the courts and all of Prithian is kind of experiencing this blight on magic that's making all of their powers weakened, allowing some of the borders between the different courts and realms to kind of shrivel and disappear or like weaken where 
evil you got some, like, fairies evil shit can come through. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We find out that stuff isn't good, and essentially the serial just keeps saying, like, stay with Tamlin, you'll be safe. And that's pretty much it before the Nara attack, and she's gotta <laughs> free the serial and, like, run for her life and, and stab some fools. But I do think this is kind of the turning point, too, because once they come home, Tamlin and her sort of find a truce. He sort of tells her and fills in the gaps of knowledge that she was missing, mm -hmm. and he also... Sort of. Sort of. He doesn't tell her everything, obviously, <laughs> but he fills in some of the gaps, and she ends up asking for art supplies. He says, like, oh, I have this gallery, let me show you the gallery, mm -hmm. and I'll find you art supplies. And I think we're supposed to believe, you know what, the stuff that he was keeping from her, it's because he's, like, kind of a good guy, and he's very humble and down to earth, and also mm -hmm. he's, like, helping her. He's not really a kidnapper. Yeah, this is where it really starts to turn from her being completely on the defensive to, I'm gonna have to be here for a while, so maybe I should take advantage of this free time and, uh, and like, comfort that I had always searched for because back I in the human realm. Up until this point, she has really been focused on getting back and, and helping her family, and I think it's actually kind of hard to read about for for me at least, because it's kind of sad how much she knows that her family doesn't need her and that they probably don't give a shit that she's gone. <laughs> Tamlin tells her pretty early on that her family is going to be taken care of and that there's just because she's gone doesn't mean they're not gonna eat. So she knows that they're probably better taken care of than they would be without her and that they probably don't miss her. And I'm sure that's pretty frustrating given that they weren't appreciative of her in the first yeah, place. Yeah, exactly. But she's still constantly at work herself until this point where she does ask for those art supplies and she's like, you know what, I'm gonna move on with my life a little bit. and we. Do again start kind of experiencing that like romantic tension mm. that I think kind of sets the groundwork for the rest of the book. I mean this book is I mean that's Beauty and the Beast it's like romance heavy. So. Yeah I believe after the the fight with the Naga is like when we get the first uh like tension from like touching between them like they haven't touched like at all before this and then they touch and they don't you know really share an intimate moment but she still gets hot between her legs is what she keeps saying which I hate so much but sometimes the undercarriage gets a little overheated. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of touching and like subtle glances, but I think the writing is a little high, high brow, so you kind of get this like historical vibe to it, and that's sort of how, how it was in historical times. It's like, oh shit, a little bit of ankle, I'm moist. The thing to me was like the note that I wrote was, where the hell did the romance come from? <laughs> we previously mentioned before this, they're very cold and standoffish mm -hmm. to each other, and any question that he asks her is met with a lot of defense as the same way, like both ways. Yes and no. I think he was pretty kind from the beginning in taking her in, mm -hmm. in the first place, making sure her family is taken care of. He saves her and then he offers her art supplies and seems to have an interest in what she's interested oh, 100%. in. 100%. So I could definitely understand how the romantic relationship kind of develops from there. But I'm just saying from her end, I guess especially, she's still, she seems like put off by him, you know, she doesn't want to be near him. Every time that she's near him, she talks about how scared she is of the fact that you know, he can, like, turn into a beast and, like, rip people's heads mm, off. Like, she's like, I don't remember says, that. Maybe yeah, I just she, keep, really she keeps saying, uh, I could never forget what he can become and the power that lies beneath this well, human flesh. She and forgets pretty quick. Does she? She takes her pants off pretty quick, doesn't she? Yeah, but maybe that's just because she wants the beast. Okay, so, yeah. fair. Romance, brother. Yeah. That's the romance. Okay, now we can move on to the fun stuff. I don't know if it's really fun, but from here we get more, like, romantic montages, then you know stuff's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's building up, right? Um, and I was getting such Edward Bella vibes, I don't know if you were too, but they go to this, like, Glenn, Farrah, yeah, Tamlin, and... Definitely. And, uh, what's the motherfucker's name? Lucian? Oh, she asks him when they're in this, like, silver lake or whatever, this, like, It's river. a lake of starlight. Whatever. Um, Which I just had a comment about after this, but... She asked, when, he, when were you a boy? And he said, a very long time ago. And I was like, Edward. It's Edward. Oh, I feel you. Yeah, I actually didn't even, like, notice that. But that's a good point. He still looks, uh, what did she say? Like, mid to late 20s. But he's at least 500 years old at because least. he was a boy when the war started. And that got me thinking, as I was reading, if I was going to give this book a tagline, it would be Twilight meets Stockholm Syndrome. It's nice. Star-crossed lovers, age gap, <laughs> relationship. I love a good captor romance, <laughs> honestly. What were you going to say about the star starlight water just what the hell what is what does that even mean she says it looks like starlight and he says it is starlight there's just so many things that don't make sense to me about That's possibly a lake made of starlight <laughs> i don't know why I, I just don't even understand I don't know where to begin to understand that. This is a that. fantasy. Okay, I'll, I guess I'll just leave it there. I was wondering about, about the texture of the lake, though, because she said that it's not like water, but it's thinner than oil, so I'm imagining, like, swimming through mercury or, like... She says... She says... She says it's not like water. It's thicker. It's not like oil. It's thinner. It's thicker and thinner. 
at the same time. They're two different substances, I know it. No, I know. It was, it was weird. Like okay. in between water and oil. There's, I'm sure, lots of liquids that have. No, 100% there are. Different. But. Viscosities. It was just a weird description. I think there were a lot of weird descriptions in this book. The next thing we learn is that Lucian's girlfriend was murdered by his dad. So Lucian <laughs> killed some of his brothers and went to live with Tamlin, which sounds very healthy. Yeah, that's nice. I didn't really have anything to add to this. I just felt like I needed to make note of it. Um, yeah, me neither, well, except for <laughs> the, everything uh, in this world uh, looks beautiful, but apparently is much more violent and evil than anything else. So. Oh, you have no idea. Do I not? Yeah, book, book Even two, from book one? Book two gets down and dirty and there's a lot of violence. <laughs> so we might just have to read book two. Let us know if you want us to read book two. Uh, do you guys make her like give me something good to read? No. And the only other thing that I have really for this part of the book is, aw, dirty poems. So there's a part in the book where you learn that Farrah can't read mm -hmm. and she starts writing words so that she can like figure out what the words mean and that she can write a letter to her family telling them how she feels and stuff because she refuses to learn how to write or read from Tamlin and she also refuses to let him write it for her like her dictate he write so she's gonna like learn herself and he finds mm. this thing of like random words and he makes them into dirty limericks and reads them to her I think we're supposed to think that he's just so fucking charming and like delightful yeah I didn't really get it none of them seemed dirty so I didn't understand well I like how they were dirty what is it about her always said obscene gesture and we don't get to know what that gesture was we yeah, can assume it's like cursed. or yeah. cursed and here it's like oh the fifth limerick was the dirtiest of them all but we don't actually get to hear the limerick yeah. like, why are you holding out on us bitch you have like mountain shaking orgasms in this book yeah. and yet we can't have dirty limericks <laughs> that's fucked up oh and then we get to the fun part we get cal in may which is the spring festival it's almost here we're preparing for it and in and during the preparations an adder comes to visit and warns tamlin about his behavior and the adder is sent by amarantha who we find out was like this evil fucking bad bitch who lives far away at this point we're just hearing shit she. Like this is when Farah's finally finding out that there's like someone out there that they're scared of and not just this magical blight that's letting yeah. these evil creatures into the land. So it's not just the evil creatures that are prowling the land and attacking. There there's is someone a else exactly. up top. I, I don't know about you, but I started to think like, hmm, perhaps she is the one that gave the masks, you know, like maybe she was the someone. I actually didn't think about that at first. At first. As I said earlier, I kept forgetting that they were wearing masks. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously, so many times throughout this book I forgot that they were wearing masks. Mask off. Mask and then they off. would say something about the mask or about she knew that someone was from spring court because they were wearing a mask and I was like oh, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they got these stupid ass masks on. But despite that warning Callan May comes around and it's this kind of sexy festival when <laughs> whoever what, I don't know what they call like the, the sacrifice guy. I don't know if he's really a sacrifice. Basically we have our main guy Tamlin, and he is presiding over this festival, right? He ends up having to kind of select someone to copulate with, and they are going to replenish the earth with their magic, and everybody else is gonna like kind of fuck too. Yeah, they gotta save the crops. Save the crops with my seed. Fair is warned to stay back, and she doesn't actually know what the, the intent of the festival is. Like, she understands to an extent, but mm, she goes to the festival, and she gets saved, essentially, or like carried back to the house during said festival, and Lucian basically tells her like, yo, unless you want to be ravaged by a beast tonight, you should <laughs> <laughs> he tells her the whole, you know, way that the festival happens and because, you know, no one's really explained it to her. So and she's he's like, like, why the fuck can't I go and party? Yeah, he's That's like, did no one explain it to you? And she's like, no, what are you talking about? And he's like, yo, she, he gonna turn into a real beast and he's gonna be on the prowl and he's gonna be inhuman. You better stay here because tonight is not for love making. And he's like, if you're out there, like he's already gonna smell your scent and wanna claim you, but it won't be Tamron who'll carry you back inside the cave to like fuck your brains out. He's gonna be inhuman. And we actually do get this happening. Oh, I, you know, as an aside, I guess, cause I think it's important. This is the first time that she meets Reese. Before she gets carried back by Lucian, she ends up being saved by Reese, who we don't actually know is Reese at the mm -hmm. time. It's just this, the most handsome man she's ever seen. She gets <laughs> saved by him. And, um, cause a couple of other Fae are trying to like basically sexually harass her. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, hey, I've been looking for you everywhere. Just like any like cool girl would do if you were out and about and you know, getting harassed. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a pretty cool move on his part and it sets up his character kind of interesting. Cause we get kind of not a role reversal later on but he definitely behaves differently. Yes and no. I think that he does like say or do some semi threatening things. Like when he first meets her uh, enough to where she is is like afraid and doesn't want any help from him and is definitely like, I'm gonna go away from you now. That's fair, but at the and, beginning- And lies to him about, you know, why she's there, who she's there with. Mm -hmm. We do find out that he's not from the Spring Court. 
I mean, he's we not do, wearing a mask. Because he's not wearing a mask, but he, he doesn't, is a high fae. He doesn't say where he's from, though, yet. He does not. So he's a mystery man. Mystery man. The most handsome man of mystery. So anyway, she gets taken back. I just, I wanted to point out that Reese, you know, was there. She gets taken back, and she actually does end up having a run-in with Tamlin. Yes, she does. She goes to get a midnight snack, and Tamlin is looking for a little midnight snack of his own. And he snacks on her neck. <laughs> he does. Uh, I think, does she ask for a kiss? I just remember this no. being kind of a No, 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 no. So he corners her in the hall way and like pins her and I smelled you at the festival and you weren't there. He's like so the other girl the, no the, the country boys like, the made spirits do. like forced me to pick another and she didn't want she specifically didn't want me to be gentle with her. I would have been gentle with you. She tries to leave and he like smashes her up against the wall and like bites her neck and shit. And I'm not sure that I'd call that gentle. She's like telling him to get off and stuff and she gets off and or he, he gets off and she goes to bed I guess. He he removes himself from the premises. He doesn't get off, you know what I'm saying? One thing that I will mention here, because I feel like it's an appropriate time, how many times people growl and or purr. I really didn't like it. Um, and he expressed that to me. <laughs> he just, he, well, he came up out of nowhere and just started growling in my ear and he's like, which would you prefer? Like a growl or a purr? Um, didn't like it at all. <clears throat> yeah, yeah I don't understand fan. And then that. they just, they just keep doing it. I think it's just supposed to like, just be very alpha and like, <laughs> I'm part beast. And then after that, she eventually shows Tamlin the, the paintings that she's done. And that same same night, she ends up not locking her bedroom door. Mm. She's like, Subtle. please sneak in. And then I think we get kind of the beginning of the actual conflict of the book, right? So Reese comes to visit and he threatens Tamlin and he decides to send Farrah away, but not before boning her first. Yeah, and uh, not before Sarah J. Mass uses one of the more disgusting phrases of the book. <laughs> what would that be? He sheathed himself inside me. I must have missed that one. Oh yeah, you missed that one? That That's the just, only time where she explicitly describes the fact that they are indeed fucking and not just like finger rolling banging. around or mm -hmm. finger banging or like biting nips or something like that. Ow. Yeah, because they do talk about that as well. Uh, but yeah, this this time she says that uh, he sheathed himself inside me. I thought that was very special. He put on the glove of love. Mm. My glove of love. <laughs> he entered my... Love Glove. I don't like what you're doing here. So, yeah, uh, basically, Reese ends up coming, and we didn't really, like, say what Reese said. Reese was basically very fucking scary. They end up trying to, like, hide her from him, but he knows that she's there, which I think is, like, kind of hot. Well, he scary. figures out because there's an extra place setting with that's, like, full of food and wine at the table. Yeah, they're like, like mm, she went away. And it's not very like, difficult to notice. <laughs> <laughs> with all due respect, my good bitch, I see there are three place settings here. And he does, like, look her dead in the eye. I think he can actually see through no, the... He no, like, I think right when that happens, the glamour, like, kind of wears off. Like, he sees her because he then... I think he's just fucking powerful, and the other two are little bitches. Yeah, well, I just know that he definitely can see her mm -hmm. at some point before he leaves because he recognizes her from uh, Cal and May, and he also then later on is questioned on whether or not this is the same girl. Whenever she shows back up under the mountain, which we'll talk about in a minute, but he's asked very specifically if this is, is this the girl. girl. Yeah. And she's like, no, I'm Claire. Yeah, at that point he asks her name and she says Claire. So that kind of sets up the real conflict of this book, which is the fact that- Keep going then. We're almost fucking there. So then we move on to the real conflict of the book, which is the fact that Amarantha, we learn more about her. She is the kind of anonymous she we were hearing about from the Adder at the beginning, near Cal and May. And we find out that Amarantha really hates humans because her sister ended up boning a human, got betrayed by the human, and Amarantha's like, you don't kill my sister like that, fuck these humans. So her plan was to go to Prithian. She is a very powerful war general from a distant Fey land, not Prithian. She comes to Prithian because Prithian is very close to human lands and she's going to kind of stake her claim and set up camp in Prithian so she can plan her attack on the, the humans that are close by. We find out about this and we also find out that this curse that she has put on Tamlin um, and the Spring Court and basically everybody is very much about power and magic and the one that's specifically put on Tamlin though is for... He needs to fall in love basically. He said like, I would rather... Um, 
bone a human and bone you forever or something like that because she wants him to be her mm -hmm. consort and she's like yeah i'd rather bone a human so she puts a curse on him saying that like you have to fall in love with a human who's like deadly and like doesn't like Faye and will kill Faye. everything sort of starts to unfold from there we'd like oh, okay that's why she's here and that's why they're like nice to her Which <laughs> okay. is, so yeah she gets sent back home as we mentioned like right after tamlin bones her for the first time uh yeah. she finds out that her family is doing fine and living in a mansion and like tamlin got it all set up to where they're rich again and stuff and then she just like can't stop thinking about that something is like something's super, wrong like why would wrong. he send yeah. her away after like making sweet sweet love to her yeah was she a bad leg she tells her sister everything that happened which her sister was never fooled in the first place mm -hmm. like the she rest was never of her family glamoured, yeah and the rest of her family gets unglamored and it's like yes go fix your problems yeah, the family is pretty irrelevant i would say yeah. in the big scheme of things she ends up going back to the fey lands and she learns more she learns about amaranth yeah then. the spring court is empty when she returns mm -hmm. and except for alice luckily. alice who we didn't talk about at the beginning but she is the servant basically to farah she gives the heftiest exposition i've ever seen in a book it was a whole chapter dump. of expedition. <laughs> of expedition. <laughs> yeah, this is where we find out about all of this stuff. And I, the only reason that I wanted to bring all of this up is because as she's telling her this story, she keeps, uh, Vera keeps saying things, you know, like my stomach turned as she, you know, tells her some mm -hmm. specific part of the information. And at one point she says, my bowels turned watery. Ew. And she said that again <laughs> later in the book. And I was like, bitch got diarrhea. Yeah. I was like, you got diarrhea? Like that specific? I mean, I guess if something real bad's going down. <laughs> I've never, I've never experienced diarrhea. Anxiety out of diarrhea. Nerve. Yeah. And also, uh, I mean, Lucky just you. a quick mention later, uh, later on in the book, they mentioned some guy pees his pants and... You know what? That happens often though. That's like not an uncommon thing. People, is it? People pee pee their pants. I just, uh, pee, I'm pee, like, poo -poo. just pee before you go do some stuff, you know? Like who walks around like really having to pee? Sometimes people... That's not... I don't understand how that works. Okay, well, Pink that's... Like, does, that's it, a... does it force your bladder to squeeze? Because in my mind, that kind of situation is always like you lose control of it. Like, you really had to pee, but now you just, like, can't hold it in anymore, <laughs> no, you know? Because not... you're so scared. I think neither of those things. And I think that's a discussion for a later day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. But thank you for, for making note of for the, the watery bowels. bowels. Yes, yeah, I, I thought it was one of the more strange lines I've ever read in a book. And to be used more than once as well. So anyway, uh, Farrah decided... <laughs> that she's gonna go to this fucking mountain where uh, Amarantha is, where everybody is basically being held captive after the seven by seven years, 49 years. Wow, the multiplication that they made me do, I think, was a little unfair. You probably haven't done that since grade school. She ends up going to the mountain, and to save her beloved, she has to enter into a trial. Like, three tasks, essentially. She gets immediately captured immediately whenever she gets captured. there. Yeah, they're like, yo. And thrown in jail. <laughs> you stupid. And she gets thrown in jail, and she's basically given a riddle to solve. I couldn't really remember, but I think if she had solved the riddle, she wouldn't have to do the trials, correct? No, yeah, so she she says, you can do these trials, and I'll let you go. Or, if you can solve my riddle, because I'm feeling particularly saucy, I'll throw you this riddle, and and if you can solve it, then I'll let you go immediately. But she's stupid and can't read and have no comprehension of riddles. So question. No logic. Did you, you did you guess the riddle yes, when you first read it? Immediately. Okay, cool. That's Literally me too. Literally immediately. I was just making sure. I wish they would have made it more difficult because I think that would have yeah, been it. Would have been cool. Understand? But that's what I'm saying. I thought she was a dumb fucking bitch. Like we get that you can't read. Well, but no, but that here's the thing. Mean she didn't read stupid. it to her. No, I know. She says it to her. That's, so well, but I had to read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. It's a book. <laughs> but maybe they gave her a piece of. I don't know. You I'm had to read about how this. Farrah couldn't read. How meta is that? Yeah, she, so she can't figure out the riddle because she's a dumb bitch. This is so welcome basically, to the dumb bitch book the rest the rest of this book is basically just her entering these trials, swimming through mud with a worm, um, trying to kill people and do shit so she doesn't end up dying herself and her love doesn't die. Intermixed in this, we get her like being in a dungeon and having a lot of interactions with Reese. Yeah, we're setting up the the their kind of relationship, you know, like their interactions and how they're going to. Yeah, each other. in her first trial, she almost dies and at, like afterwards, is like dying from an infection in her. Mm -hmm. arm slowly and Reese saves her but on a condition that once she finishes all of it Reese gets to have her for a week out of every month uh she bargains that down, down from, from two, two weeks, weeks. To one yeah week, yes. so we also get a lot of Reese whoring her out kind of not really but making her like get drunk exactly. on fairy That's wine and dance this, at parties this whole and like portion of the book is just trials illness and then her basically having to go to these like dance parties kind of and she gets drunk every night and she's dressed really scantily and she kind of forgets everything oh, and, that happens and, every night. Oh, uh, and Reese licks her tears away. Sometimes we just want a 
salty snack, okay? I was just Don't so confused it. by that. She, like, after the second trial, she's weeping because she almost died because she can't read. And, like, the only reason that she survived is because Reese, like, Reese did some interfere, mind yeah. shit. She's, like, in her cell crying because he tells her not to cry in front of Amarantha. Don't give her the satisfaction. And then she gets back to her cell and starts crying and he comes in and, like, licks her tears away to get her to stop crying. I just thought that that was, like, the weirdest shit. I mean, if someone licked my tears out of the blue that I didn't really know, I'd probably start stop crying and be like, what the fuck are you doing? So I mean, I guess that's, I, true. that's a tactic that he used and I kind of respect it. I also kind of liked how complex his character was up front. I feel like Tamlin is kind of one note and then we get this kind of complexity from Reese because he's he has to put up this front with Amarantha. Mm -hmm. He wants to be more honest with her and he admits that like she is the only person that he can really be honest with multiple times and so he confides in her and she's like, why the fuck are you telling me and this he's stuff? A, he's also putting up a front for Tamlin as well. He's specifically trying to enrage Tamlin more because he understands that once they break the curse, Tamlin being extremely pissed off and full of rage, like to the most that he could be, is the only way that they'll for sure, you know, be able to win the battle against Amarantha even this with their powers. He's very scheming, very manipulative yeah. And I kind of do hope that we get to read book two because you really get to see the full effect of that, mm -hmm. um, which is something that I noticed at the end of the book. I feel like we don't really need to talk too much about the trials because I didn't feel like they were all that interesting. No, not really. Was there anything you wanted to like remark upon before we kind of wrap things up? No, except for like, uh, yeah, just the last trial is the only thing that I would want like to really talk touch about upon. More, yeah. Sure. So in the last trial, she's supposed to kill three people and if she kills three people, then her love is free. And that third person that she's gonna kill is actually Tamlin. And it's like, what's the fucking point? Like, th honestly, that was like kind of a stupid thing, in my opinion. Making Tamlin the third person, she like, what? she's not gonna do that. I think that is the point. She's like, I win because I'm clever, ha ha ha. And like, the funny part to her is that she made her kill two people before that. It took a lot for her to do that. And then she gets to the end and it's either like, what, now either I kill Tamlin and win the challenge, or I don't kill Tamlin, I die and I killed two people for nothing. It's kind of funny haha because it's at the end of the challenge, you know? Like she already had to kill two people to even get to see that Tamlin was the third. The thing that I wanted to touch on was she figures out that she can stab Tamlin because he has a heart made of stone. <laughs> what the fuck did this book just become? Like, yeah, I felt like that was a bit too convenient. I kind of liked- It was stupid. I liked the idea of her killing him. I wish that at the end, obviously Farrah becomes Saife. That's not really a spoiler. That just, I mean, we're talking about everything. Thing, right that fucking happens and I kind of wish that something similar had happened. He would have actually died and then maybe some of the high court would have had to like basically bring him back to life. That would have been more impactful. This whole like her trying to be smart. I don't I don't I also like it. I didn't I, think it was necessary. Especially when she's been so fucking stupid this whole book and yeah. we're supposed to believe that she's just magically oh he's got a heart of I, stone. I really uh, I hated more than anything the fact that she turned into Haifei at the end. Really? Yeah, honestly, that was my least favorite part of this whole book. Why? Where did this come from out of nowhere? All of the high lords just like sprinkle a little, a little flex of you know, the salt bayer. She turns into Haifei. She turns into high bay, you know? Yeah, just the, the stone heart thing. I was like, I do, I do feel like the ending ridiculous. of this book wrapped up too conveniently. I do want to say though, I think it, it does, it's kind of nice in a way because I don't think you have to continue with the series if you don't want to. Yeah, so yeah, it really wraps up in a way that I was like, oh, okay, we're done here, which I feel like has happened in the last couple of books that I've read. They haven't been like that cathartic and yeah. in such a way that when I'm finished, I'm like, oh, we're done here? Like that and was it? I think it? normally that would irritate me if I didn't know what happens in the second book and how wildly different and plot twisty it is compared to this one. So I think having it kind of wrap up and it kind of lulls you into a false sense of security when you go into the second book. Wow, I am looking at my notes and I forgot to say that reading really is fundamental. <laughs> Fair is fucking dumb. Also, I forgot that at the very end we get the reveal and you know everything's obviously like fucking sunshine and roses because it's the end of like a fairy tale retelling. We get to see Tamlin's face and it's just as Farrah imagined it. And uh, I wrote that down too. It's like uh, of course, of course it, is. it is. Yeah. And of course she had to describe it halfway through the book as to what she thought that it would look and like. And she points it out again and she says that he has a broad brow and I was like does that mean he has a big fucking forehead? I'm just imagining Tamlin with like a, a really like, like a helicopter long. landing pad. <laughs> and it kind of like comes out onto his face you know, it kind of like hangs over. Oh yeah, I know what you're like talking about. Like intent. where like your eyes and nose are like sunk back from your, from forehead. your forehead. And it's just... <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> yes! Exactly. So I'm gonna picture Tamlin forever like Frankenstein. And then I just said all happy endings. So Yeah, it's oh. whatever. They they literally I mean I guess they mentioned it a couple times, but like bitch just killed two innocent people and like she's like everything just died. She's like, doesn't matter, I'm a high fae now. And like she literally says, Me 
turning high fey the only thing that's allowing me to like wash my hands clean of their deaths and i'm like but what does that have anything to do with it you're still guilty you did that he does talk about how she has like a mortal heart too because she has what i did want to point out uh, at the very end is she does have a final run-in with reese i don't know if you remember kind of what the like final do you remember kind of like what happens at the very end of their interaction what happens at the very end? He, like, looks at her in shock. Oh, yeah, he looks at her in shock away. and then, like, flies away. And yeah. I didn't remember that at yeah, all. Yeah, I, I actually forgot to write that down, but uh -huh. I did have a question about that. I think that I didn't write it down because I expected to, like, get to the end of a chapter and then have another chapter and be able to write my thought. But the end of the chapter, like, a page later was just the ending. And yeah, I was like, like, oh, okay. Okay, nothing's coming of that. But, yeah, um, what the fuck? And I didn't remember it, and now I'm just, like, soft. So, comes up in the second book. So, question... And also, might I add, she is not remorseless for these deaths. She deals with PTSD in the second book. No, so. I know. I mean, she, she like I said, she, I mentioned, she, she mentioned it a couple it, of times. But it obviously isn't very touched upon. That is true. Yeah, that is it, like, it ends very <laughs> shortly after, and it's, like, barely mentioned. But, uh, so, I, I think my only question, I guess, for the second book in Curiosity, she's high fey now. Yes. Does she ever get powers? Oh, yeah. So... So, fun stuff. What would you rate this out of five stars? Ah, uh, five stars. This is definitely better than Brayshaw. I'd give it a three, I think. Generous king. <laughs> yeah, I'd give it a three. Like, it definitely wasn't painful to read. There were a lot of things that were repetitive about it. You know, a lot of feelings that she had or that, you know, mm -hmm. he had that ended up being repetitive. And she did a lot of time just, like, sulking and kind of feeling sorry for herself. I mean, it was definitely a character-driven book rather I than plot-driven. I really hate that. I'm going to be honest, the first... 60% of this was, I don't want to say hard to read, but it was just like slow. It yeah, was like really it's, it's slow. Very, it's a character and, driven. And like you said, it's character it. driven. I'm not a huge character driven kind of person. I like plot. I'm sticking with my original rating of five stars. So. Five stars, really? <laughs> I like it. Like I said, uh, to me, the, the characterization is very relatable. A lot of the things that she went through were relatable. Not that I've ever been in like a Stockholm Syndrome situation. Or like a situation where you've had to take care of your own family or like, you know, okay, be a hunter or like, you know, do trials to save your lover. Or, like, <laughs> you know, really do anything to retain the love of your significant other. Except for force him to do these things with me. Yeah. Like read these books. But no, I, I like I said, I like the characters a lot. I like character driven stories more than plot driven stories. I think the plot near the end is weak. I, I mean, if we're going off of like objective goodness, I would think I would give this more of like a three and a half, four star. My enjoyment and knowing what comes next, to me, this is a five star read. And also having read so much YA fantasy and more so lately. This there's... is at the top of the list of <laughs> YA fantasy. <laughs> it, it's it, the kind of fantasy that I enjoy, which okay. is very like romance and, and character centric. I don't, I just don't give a shit about plot that much. Like it doesn't excite me. See, I like plot and, and if you have weak to your point, uh -huh. I will say like the trials at the end could have been a lot cooler. Like I'm glad that they were quick. That was my all like. Three of them were really dumb. Wait, yeah. really thinking the whole time, wait, these were the trials that she came up with that she didn't think that, that this Farrah girl would be able to complete? Yeah, I just, I did like it. It was good. I would not be upset to read the second one. I'll probably reread it whether or not we do it for this series or not, but I... I need some other books in between, <laughs> is all I gotta say. <laughs> so I guess that kind of segues us into the end of this. Please let us know if you enjoyed this. Actually, don't let me know because I don't want to be sad. But do comment <laughs> down below, it, like, what books you would like to see us read. I'd like classic YA with female protagonists that are perhaps kind of stupid. That's the name of our book club. Um, yeah. The Tavish Book Club. If you would like to uh, give us any suggestions, please do in the comments down below. We would really appreciate that. But I think that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Love you guys so much. And, Thank you. And until next time. We're in love. <laughs> this is gonna be the thumbnail. Do I look like I have no neck? You look like a frog. Me? Yeah, or you look uh, a toad. The toad has no neck. So frogs are skinny? Yeah, skinnier. I mean, I don't know that I would say that they have a neck, but they have more of a neck than toad. Pulling out the top. Sloppy toppy. All right, you ready? Temporarily forgot how to drink through a straw. Here, my dad. Boogie, boogie, boogie. Oh yeah? Showing them your cakes? I got the notes on lock. I don't know what you're bringing to the table today. Not very much.